My name is Herman van der Merwe. I'm the deputy dean responsible for teaching and learning in the faculty. It's going to be my privilege to welcome you to this inaugural address tonight. A specific welcome to Prof. Linda Duplessis, our deputy vice chancellor, planning and cap campus operations, and also our vice principal, Prof. Bab Surjal, our executive dean. Prof. Teba Moroke, our Deputy Dean Community Engagement and Stakeholder Relations, our Academic and Research Directors and Deputy Directors of the Faculty, and then our Professor of Practice uh, in Tillet SA, Prof. Terence Komal. Hearty welcome to all of you. Welcome also to all our colleagues here in the Faculty, those from other faculties and also colleagues from the Center for Teaching and Learning, and we have got people from all three campuses here tonight, and what wonderful, how wonderful it is to welcome you all here. And of course, the reason why we are here 
tonight. Provarona. You and your friends and your family, a hearty welcome to you. Especially to your son, Ziad. Where is Ziad? There's Ziad, <laughs> hiding there. Her siblings, Anna-Marie, Tyler and Jonita, Leanderts. And then I, I promised I will keep quiet with all the things that they did, but her lifelong friend, Ilse Dube, and Ilse's husband, George Dube, and I promised them if they look well after me, I won't, dis I won't disclose all the stories I've heard. <laughs> Colleagues, I hope you are all welcome and you're going to enjoy the evening with us. It is really a proud and joyful occasion for the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, and I want you to celebrate with us tonight. But you know what? We are in higher education, so I must learn you something. Otherwise, what's the reason why we're here? So I sort of looked at the word professor, and that word professor was first recorded in the late 14th century and is directly deduced. Sorry, I'm pressing buttons here. Sorry, 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 uh, Verona. Now I need to say... Okay, good, sorry. You, don't, you, don't, you shouldn't let me press buttons, ne? But okay, so let's, let's look at the word uh, professor that was coined in, in the 14th century, deducted from the Latin word, which means a person who professes or to be an expert in some art or science or a teacher of the highest rank. As a noun, it is the word profiteri, means to lay a claim to or declare openly or to profess. It was first recorded in 1706 as the title prefixed to a name, and the short form prof was recorded in 1838. So it's some background where the word professor comes from, and with that in mind and in recognition of the excellence of, acad of, of, of exceptional academic leadership, the Northwest University confers on the bearers of these qualifications the highest academic title of professor. But I must say, it's not that easy, <laughs> especially not in our faculty, and I think there are a number of people who can attest to that. A professorship comes with some stringent requirements and responsibilities. So it's, for instance, expected of a professor, in our faculty specifically, to be the intellectual leader in a subject field to be recognized by colleagues and industry as a leader in their field, to be extensively involved in sharing their knowledge with their peers, initiate and create research opportunities and guide and supervise students, train and encourage other staff members, act as a role model for their juniors and make a substantial contribution to the effective management and functioning of the school and the faculty. And of course, also be an outstanding and innovative lecturer. So now you see the traits, you see Pro Verona, and therefore I can declare that Prof. Prof. Verona Leonards has complied with all the criteria, as mentioned, for the University for Excellence and Exceptional Academic Leadership. And that's why we're here today. The inaugural address is there for an opportunity for a newly promoted professor to inform the colleagues, peers, and the general public about their research career and to update us on their current and future research directions. And it really marks the pinnacle of the professor's intellectual pursuit. And now that we do it in hybrid mode and we can record it, you can really have a record of that uh, for years to come. The Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences are privileged to have five staff members presenting inaugural addresses this year in various disciplines. Pro Verona, you can celebrate this important personal milestone with your family, friends and colleagues tonight. And as we all know, I'm very, very passionate about teaching and learning and especially about innovation in teaching and learning. Now, a little confession from my side. I had some inside information regarding uh, tonight, 
So my recommendation is to buckle up <laughs> because in a address igniting innovative teaching and connecting multifaceted dimensions for immersive learning, I think will be something to look forward to. I request Prof. Babs, our Executive Dean, to please introduce Prof. Verona to us. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Herman, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yes. Who is Verona? <laughs> Do any one of you see anyone called Verona around here? <laughs> right, yes, so it is my very pleasant task this evening to introduce to you the person of the moment, Prof. Verona Liendertz. Verona was born and raised in Pucklesdorp and is the youngest of six siblings. She completed her matric at Pucklesdorp Secondary School in 1990. After completing her teaching qualification, she taught mathematics for 17 years. I don't know how she managed that, but <laughs> it's some achievement. She furthered her qualification and obtained numerous qualifications through the unit for distance learning. And uh, for her master's degree studies, she received the CITES 2006 project funding and an ETDP CETA bursary. In 2012, she was awarded the Sol Plyke full-time scholarship to pursue her PhD studies at Northwest University. In 2012, she was part of a North-South-South exchange program at the University of Eastern Finland, where she studied PhD courses and collaborated on research projects. She graduated with a PhD in training and development from the Northwest University. She joined the Northwest University as a staff member in 2015 after her postdoctoral fellowship in South Africa and Finland. From 2015 to 2018, she had a dual appointment in the faculty of the then Economic Sciences and Information Technology Faculty and the Center of Teaching and Learning where she steered numerous projects and she focused on academic development and scholarship of teaching and learning. She has been involved in several international research funded projects and for three consecutive years, she received a Research Excellence Award at the Northwest University Vanderbilt Park campus. Since 2017, she has been an executive member for the Advanced Association for computers in education, and she coordinates the emerging scholar stream for the Ed Media Innovate Learn Conference. In 2019, she was appointed as research director in TELIT SA within the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. And during this time, she supervised numerous masters and PhD students, both at Northwest University and at the University of Eastern Finland. And some of her products are around here and uh, they are going to be part of this beautiful function. And I don't know why all of you are so serious, you know, I mean, this is a celebration. So just, uh, just broaden that, uh, your cheeks or whatever. <laughs> right, so in 2022, she was appointed as the Deputy Dean for research and innovation in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. So in her current position, she has displayed excellent management and leadership skills, which continuously rub off on our aspiring staff. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Prof. Herman said buckle up, but I will say, let us sit back and experience how Prof. Verona ignites innovative teaching amongst us.
you see. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. Um, good evening, Prof. Linda Duplessis, our DVC um, and Vice Principal on the Van der Vale Park campus. My colleagues from the faculty, from other faculties, friends, family, students, um, welcome here this evening. Um, this evening, I would just like to share some aspects of my research journey and present you with a model I have developed um, to ignite innovation and connect the dimensions of immersive learning. Uh, so what I will do is I will just briefly explain some concepts uh, uh, and then I will go into the show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so many educational experts always advocate that immerse, uh, teaching and learning is a systematic, sequential, planned course of action, and and that the f facilitators and students uh, um, engage in to achieve the outcomes. However, I do not agree with this uh, simplistic description of what teaching and learning entails. I perceive teaching and learning to be a very complex, integrated, dynamic process that involved multifaceted philosophies, strategies, and other factors that guide and shape the course of action. More importantly, teaching should be innovative and should stimulate immersive learning. However, due to the complexity, we often execute this course of action without really interrogating the other factors that influence innovative teaching. Okay, so my slide is showing. Okay, so why innovative teaching? We often think of innovation as a buzzword of the early 20th century, but actually this phenomena has been dominant already from the early 1900s and even in the late 1970s, uh, 77s, who advocated that technology, yeah, that technology, we think that technology is only a phenomena that we come into play into the 2000 or the late um, 1900s. But this is actually been a word that has been used dominantly in the field of ed education for many years. So I stand by the motto is innovate or pine away. Um, and this is actually um, the the concept that talks about growth, progress, innovation, and change. And I think when we were, walk in this space of higher education, we need to embrace this, innovate or pine away. So Darwin and Jean-Baptiste Lamarck advocated that survival depends on the ability to change. Abandoning innovation means stagnation, and stagnation means decline. Therefore, as facilitators of innovative teaching and learning, we should embrace this innovation. Okay. Okay. So what does innovation mean? It's actually, we must be open to change. We must alert to new ideas and forge them into something uniquely our own. And that is very important and that's why you can see there's a lot of my talent members here tonight and that is actually by the motto that we stand. If e effective interaction with our students. Our students are sitting there in front of us and it's our responsibility really to change and shape them into our future graduates. Um, we must persist and our students must engage. And when I go through the rest of the speech, you will understand why engagement for me is such a um, critical aspect when we talk about teaching and learning. And 
as we teach and learn, we have to reflect on what we do. It's very important. And um, my sister sitting here and she said, oh, this reflection, I hate this reflection exercise uh, that she always has to write. But it's so important, even if we don't write, we must sit back and think and reflect. What are we doing? Are we doing it right? What can I change? And what can I make better for my students to really have an immersive uh, experience? And also, um, there's certain discipline-specific things that we have to integrate within our teaching and learning. And now, immersive learning is timeless and independent of technology advances. So we often think that, you, you know, to become immersive is really becoming immersive in the different types of technology that we have. But it's not really that. It's really independent of the technological advances. It's actually mediation with those technologies that we engage with. Also, we have to facilitate learning and use the technology affordances. Now, there's a difference between the tools and what the tools can offer for us. And important, we have to encourage a sense of presence and co-presence. And during this interaction, we start building the identity of those students that are sitting in front of them. So, uh, what you see in front of you is a new model that I developed now uh, while I was busy preparing uh, for my inaugural address because for some time now I've wanted to develop or expand on an existing framework that actually connect all these complexities of teaching and learning and advocating how we can go about to, in, to have immersive learning for our students. So as you can see, the... Um, I, if you look at the model, um, it's a the original model that I've used to adapt this was a very small part of this module. It's only in the center part where you can see pedagogical immersion. That was basically that four aspects and some of the affective and cognitive aspects were the only aspects that um, was part of a model that I used to actually adapt and expand this model from. So this is actually an expansion from the model of Makransky and Peterson, and I've included many other aspects from Plas, Homer, Kinzer, Anderson, Hamilton, um, Vygotsky's theories. I've incorporated multiple aspects um, to actually have these complex uh, different uh, dimensions that we actually um, see when we really engage in through um, teaching and learning, advocating for innovation, and really getting students to become immersed in learning. So in many cases, we actually um, separate the pedagogical aspects from the learning aspects, and we often think focus on one of those uh, dimensions. But actually, the whole exercise in what we're teaching and learning starts is actually with the pedagogy, with the, with the teaching aspects. What is my deeper inherent philosophy? How do I view the world? How do I see teaching and learning? Do I have the necessary technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge? And that's the integration when all those three core elements come together so that you know you have the technological knowledge, but you also have the pedagogical knowledge in order to ensure that the students, that you can teach and use the right uh, technology to ensure that immersive learning can take place. Also, very important, our, um, our belief system, our attitudes as also um, uh, um, uh, facilitators of learning has to be, we should have the right attitude also. Because if we don't have the right attitude, then we won't um, ensure that immersive learning will take place. And then we also have our student. Our student that comes in our class from a different background, from their own pre-knowledge. There's a lot of things that comes into play. So when we start this teaching and learning process, we actually have to take many other things into consideration. 
and also we have our different tools and as you can see there's um, user interface design is right at the bottom. Now when we do our user interface design in our learning management system and we put different things into our learning ma management system in order to ensure that uh, the students engage. Now um, Kurs is sitting here, Gordon is sitting here, and uh, they've actually developed a beautiful model um, that you can actually evaluate the, your learning management system to ensure that there's no hindrances in terms of the cognition. And that we also test, um, we are busy with the project and they actually testing it with eye tracking to ensure that there's not cognitive overload of information for the students. And then as you go up into the technology, the higher you go up, the more immersion can take place. So that's very important uh, to take note of. And then we have our control factors, our presence, our agency, I will touch on, on that. And then we have our different types of engagement that we get. And at the end of the day, once the students really engage, they actually come up, they can have the factual knowledge, the conceptual knowledge, and all the different types of knowledge will come into play and they will gain that knowledge once that processes are all interlinked into each other. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to simplify this by telling you a story and I'm going to use the story uh, of Dungeons and Dragons. You know the game of Dungeons and Dragons? And I'm going to link the application of this framework that I've developed with Dungeons and Dragons. Now, Dungeons and Dragons, um, most of you probably that as kids know about Dungeons and Dragons. Now, Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game. And it's about um, storytelling in the world of swords and sorceries. Uh, and it's unlike a, a game of make-believe because Dungeons and Dragons give structure to the stories, a way of determining the consequences of the adventures. And the dungeon master is the lead storytelling. And in the classroom, the facilitator is the lead storyteller. And the the facilitator has to take the role of the dungeon master and the dungeon master's role is actually to guide those different characters within the game to actually conquer and slay the dragons. But also before, you know, the dungeon master needs to know about himself and he also needs to know who is in this world, in this dungeon and dungeon and dragon world. Because he must know that when there is quest, he must know that how he's going to guide those uh, different characters within the game and the action that takes place in the game. So, and there we come back to the framework. The dungeon master must know himself. So, I come from the world of games and we develop serious games. And that is one of the things that I'm very passionate about. So, um, you know you have your inherent philosophy and my inherent philosophy is actually built on Vygotsky's theory of social um, constructivism and how you engage with different people and by engaging with different people, you actually learn as you engage. But with games, you actually have to use different types of philosophies. That is very critical because in some stages of the game in the Dungeons of Dragon, you have to be behaviorist and other stages you have to be social constructivist and, and that is how you actually guide the, the players throughout the game. So now you can see the dungeon master has to know himself he has to have the right knowledge about what is happening into this world before those ca characters actually enter his world, okay? And he must know each one of those characters. You must know that those students that are sitting in front of you, what are their learning preferences? How do they prefer to learn? And uh, I know, uh, Naomi, you always talk about the learning styles and those things. Um, 
you know, the certain people prefer to read, certain people prefer to, to listen. And you must know as the dungeon master, what are the different attributes of those that's actually sitting in front of you? Also, we cannot um, ignore the behavioral aspects because those behavioral aspects play a pivotal role in, in when we engage with our, our, our the, the, the dungeon world. Now, here you can see there's my different characters in the in this dungeon and dragons game world. And you can see here, I'm the dungeon master and I'm here in the center of the world. And there is my different characters in my world. And each of my characters have different abilities and they have different weapons, which they are going to enter into this world to slay the dragon. Okay, okay, so before you start playing the game, you have to have a guidebook of how you're actually going to navigate this play. So the same in the classroom. You have to have a guidebook that actually tells you this is the rules, this is the general information of what is happening in this um, uh, module or in the serious game that we are developing. There's outcomes, there's side quests, which we know as activities, and there is also main quest, and that is the assessment, and that is when you slay the dragon. <laughs> okay, so the techn technological aspects. Now, control aspects um, is, is, is very important. Control aspects, agency, and our presence. Um, that is very important. So... In a game, there's degrees of control, there's immediacy of control, and mode of control. Now, the more control um, factors we engage with, the better the presence, and that actually links back again to the agency. So those three aspects actually interlink with each other in the game world. Okay. So, important. When the characters go into this dungeon and dragon game world it's important that they have the artifacts the artifacts that actually support them in their quest and as i told you when we start with user interface design videos texts those are some of the artifacts that we use board games mobile games serious games with ar um, a mixed reality, virtual reality. I can just maybe touch on, we've, I've, we've actually played around in all those different uh, types of games. And we've also uh, tested it with different types of dimensions. And what uh, Varushka's, I can actually, Varushka sitting here, what we've done, she developed a board game, but we actually integrated in the board game some also um, augmented reality aspects. So that game is so flexible that you can actually adapt it and use it for any discipline. So that was an amazing piece of work. So here you can see there is uh, the different um, uh, characters in the game and they have different weapons and those weapons are actually going to guide them through um, the journey, through this world of slaying the dragon. Okay, so... This is the world of dungeons and dragons. And this is the world of teaching and learning that we embrace and that we engage with our students. And you can see there's a lot of different obstacles. You can see there's mountains, there's rivers. They have to go through dungeons and different things actually as they embrace um, throughout the game. So... The players start the quest by delving into the ancient tomb of horrors, slipping through the back alleys of Waterdeep, hacking a, f a fresh trail through the thick jungles on the Isle of Dread. Throughout the travel, through a dungeon or the wilderness, they need to remain alert for dangers. And some characters might perform other tasks to help the group's journey. And this is the same when we in, in the classrooms. We work collectively, we engage collectively, and different strengths of different characters and the different weapons that they have, um, whether it's cognitive or affective, 
they use that weapons actually to actually conquer and slay. So what I want to talk to uh, about is two very important aspects. So in order to conquer and slay, the most critical part is to become engaged. Engagement is the most critical part in learning. Effective engagement, behavioral engagement, cognitive engagement, and also social cultural engagement. So effective engagement is actually the representation of the information. If we look at the aesthetics, when we look at the game and we look at the aesthetics of the game, that aesthetics of the game will actually motivate, will actually motivate you either to engage, to become immersed in this experience, or you actually have a negative effect in terms of that. So when we work, work in the games and we design games, design and the aesthetics of the game is very important. Also, how the interactions of the different dimensions in the games take, um, take lead. Also, how you interact with different people in the class actually makes you become engaged in your teaching and learning. Also, your interaction with the content. How do you interact with the content that's in this quest, in, that's in these activities that you have? And also, very important, attitude. Sometimes we forget attitude is very important in learning. Now, the behavioral aspects, the self-determination, the self-efficacy, the attributions, goal orientation, interest, and all those, it's, it's actually very complex to actually separate so the engagement, the effective, the cognitive, the behavioral, and the social cultural. Because when we develop games, we actually integrate that aspects very um, seamlessly. And it's actually a very complicated and complex process to engage with. But very important, when we go into the quest, self-determination, your self-efficacy, that's very important, and your the attribution, and you're going towards the goal that you want to achieve. And in our classroom, when students are sitting there, and there's a goal, they have to focus on the goal that they aim to achieve. And interest, interest in the content, interest in this game world, because if you're not interested in Dungeons and Dragons, you're gonna start the play, and you're not even through the first quest, then you're done and dusted and you don't want to engage in the game anymore. Cognitive engagement, the scaffolding, the feedback, the information, how the information is presented. And the, mo the amazing thing of our brain is our brain tends to make connections between information, what we already know, what we learn, and and what we end up actually knowing. So your pre your your working memory, your long-term memory, and your sensory memory actually engage with each other. And that is where immersive and learning also takes place. Also, gestures and movements. Sometimes we forget for students to sometimes do things engage in things, do things actively, they also learn more in the process. And that is what games can do for us. They become engaged, they become immersed, and they learn in the process. Now, the social cultural is actually the participatory, the different people come together, your social engagement, and they, they they talk about the zone of proximal development also. That also comes into play. Also, you learn by observing. Also, you learn from others as you engage in the game. Um, now, before I go back to the model, I just want to ex um, briefly touch on, on those and how we use those different elements um, and and, and the results that we found when we actually tested those different types of engagement in the game. So, um, Prof. Herman, when I joined um, the faculty in, uh, in 20, I think it was in 2014, Prof. Herman said, we must develop a game. And um, what happened is that statistics um, was one of the 
critical subjects where the students really struggled to understand statistics because the students came from various disciplines and they str struggled to grasp the concepts, of the, st the statistical concepts. And what we decided, we going to build a game. And this game, Prof. Linda, proudly, we didn't, uh, we still want to finish it, Prof. Herman, it's still our dream, was called Survive with Vuvu in the Wall. And, 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 and we actually developed the prototype and we tested the prototype in, in, with different things. And in the prototype, we um, evaluated different things. We evaluated for effective engagement in terms of looking for the design elements in the game. And also that we ensure that the, the outline, the aesthetics of the game didn't hinder the learning. And there go, Gordon worked on it. And we did um, some eye tracking evaluation just to see um, what aspects of the outline of the game didn't hinder the, the immersive experience of the students. And um, I was also working um, with a U Fractures game. Um, where we um, actually had a game and we did um, erroneous examples of mathematics. But what we did, we actually looked at uh, giving the students the wrong answer and then they had to go back and to see actually um, where the, they actually went wrong in the calculations. But what we did besides actually looking at the cognitive aspects, the results and those things, we actually tested it, the effect of um, dimensions also of the game. And what we found is that by engaging with a narrative, with a reflective narrative of the different stakeholders, the researchers, the students in the game, we found that those students actually, um, they scaffolded their effective engagement, scaffolded exactly as Kratol's effective domain. So that was amazing to see. You first receive, then you respond, and that is what we tested in this game. So that was also um, amazing to see that in many cases we sometimes think, no, is games really uh, motivating students to learn? Is it actually, um, 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 you know, putting that light bulb into the student's mind of learning. But if we test it in terms in line with that types, different types of engagement, we could see that the students really could cognitive engagement, effective engagement, and only one student go actually in the stage of fantasy in the game and fun that they really become engaged in this world. So um, um, some of the things that we did also in um, in uh, with uh, a, a project in Finland where I always, I don't do the game development, I also work on the learning aspect to actually see if true immersive learning takes place when we develop these artifacts. And um, in Lixamus, we also said that motivation, um, people become motivated to engage once they go into that fantasy aspect also. So it's amazing to see that true immersion only comes into play if students really engage with what they are doing. So that is um, something that we um, really realize that, you know, people sometimes say that, you know, why are you developing these games? What is the importance? But for me, the important is not the artifact. For me, the important is do students really learn? Do they immerse in this world? And do they walk away from an immersive learning experience? Because that is something that will stay with them forever if they really immerse in this space. Um, we uh, know that social cultural aspects actually um, um, yelps with learning, but we haven't tested it that, and that is one of the things that when I'm going to test this module, I'm really specifically going to focus on looking at these so social cultural elements, and we're going to 
with purpose, Sunay, when we work into this mobile game that we are busy developing, we are really going to look at this, that we also embrace that social cultural element and, and maybe with the narrative actually get the students to actually reflect in the narrative of how they actually engage in this so social cultural. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the model that I've developed. Um, during my engagement in preparing for this inaugural address. So um, I had a lot of um, amazing people that, that actually supported me. Um, of course, I had to sound a lot of ideas with, of course, do you think this will work? What do you think about that? So um, I just uh, want to say that similar to Dungeons and Dragons, learning and teaching it has no end road. It's an ongoing process. The quest actually never ends. Learning never ends. But it's important for us to actually take our role in this process seriously. So, the way forward. Um, my quest, my quest will be to implement this model in this project that we are busy with. And it's a very interesting project, Provlina itself, very undercover, but we've actually got already the first part of the, the character development, some of the storyline. And this is really a, a group effort. This is really a faculty effort that we're doing. And as we um, engage in this project, we're going to test this model. We're also going to do different things, but we're really going to test this model in terms of the learning aspects for, because for me, it's vital. If we do something, if we develop something, we must ensure that what we develop and do is actually something that can contribute to our students, not just their knowledge, you know, the conceptual, the factual knowledge, the procedural knowledge, but also ensuring that the graduates that we send out there are going to be well-rounded graduates. And this is FEMS Incorporated coming for you, Prof. Linda. Uh, Prof. Babs already knows about it. So I just, uh, before the thank yous, I actually mm -hmm. want to say a special thank you to the Talent SA team. I'm privileged to work in a team to create fun and immersive learning experiences for students. And what you've seen in front of you, um, I wanted to develop an artifact, a, a weird kind of artifact, but I thought um, that magazine that I've, I've made is actually just something to celebrate all of you today and to say thank you, and also a special thank you to all the hard-working colleagues that contributed and shaped my career until this stage. Thank you. And um, now I must go to my thank yous. And I'm going to put on my glasses for the thank yous. Because Prof. Bab said, Verona, you must take time with the thank yous. Because, you know, once you've said the thank yous, and you miss somebody, then you're going to feel bad afterwards. So um, I'm not going to do a slideshow. I'm just going to read my thank yous from. OK, there's nothing. OK, so thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for all for coming tonight. I didn't, um, is my, my timing? Were you happy with my timing? Perfect, OK. So. Um, Prof. Linda, I would like to extend my thanks to you, especially for, no, I don't want to display it. Okay, I don't want to explain it, display it. <laughs> especially to you for, you know, when I came to you and I said, I want to do my inaugural address. Yeah, you said yes. So thank you uh, to you. And thank you for leading the procession this evening and for really making time in your busy schedule to be here tonight. I really appreciate it. I've, I've walked some miles with you already, and it, it is really um, um, a privilege to have you here uh, this evening. To the deanery, Prof. Babs, um, Prof. Herman, Prof. Ntebu, thank you to all of you for being here tonight. To my team, my directors, my team,
Um, thank you for being there, all the research directors and also all the uh, school directors. We work so well and we have such good collegiality in the faculty and I'm so privileged to work in such an amazing faculty. Prof. Mark, also for coming here tonight, spending time. You know, you are my backbone there in the, in, in the faculty in terms of the ethics and, you know, I can press any time on your number. So thank you for making your time to be here. And Prof. Terence Kumal, first time meeting here this evening. Prof. Terence is our extraordinary professor talent SA and thank you for also all of you my CTL colleagues my students special friends thank you for for um, accepting and gracing this occasion with your presence and support your attendance add immense value um, to this gathering and I must acknowledge my the main team that actually the hard-working and the dedicated team that actually ensured that this event is so beautiful and so classy. Isme, thank you, thank you so much. You, Yana, Shantae, that is nearly getting a baby, but even she was our pregnant fairy, but she did so well. Thank you so much, Ilay, for always being there. Um, and Andre, also for the food tonight. You tightly worked hard to make this occasion so beautiful. And um, in her absence, Prof. Sunay Blachnot, when I embarked on this journey, I was privileged to have Prof. Sunay Blachnot as a mentor. And I would like to thank her for sharing her wisdom, insights, and for the opportunities that I could uh, have to broaden my horizons. Thank you to Prof. Herman for appointing me in 2015. Even if I came from education, mathematics education, you trusted that I could add value to the faculty. Prof. Babs, thank you for being a mentor to me. You know, Prof. Babs always sit down. Now it's time to mentor again. So I'm so privileged to, to have such um, a wonderful uh, people in my life to actually walk the journey. And tell it, SA team, keep me being creative and engaged. And then I would just like to thank you, my family, Ziad. Uh, Ziad has to take a, you know, has, uh, sit up, uh, you know, his mom is never home, but he's all already a grown up. To Junita, is my best friend, <laughs> my sister, Anay, thank you for coming all the way from George. And Ilsa and George, thank you for being here this evening. Um, you are a super friend. You know, we've been friends for more than 40 years. Um, and lastly, my mom, that's not here. <laughs> uh, sorry. She knows she made a lot of sacrifices <laughs> for us. Um, and just thank you, everyone. And uh, our canopies will be served now and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. I'm not going to stand on the. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, colleagues, Prof. Babs, Prof. Verona. Um, it's my privilege to congratulate you on behalf of the Northwest University um, on this milestone in your career. Um, I have to say, when I walked up the stairs and I thought, am I in the right building? I thought this event has a unique Verona Leander touch. And um, I think we can all contest to that. And we didn't expect anything less. Um, from you, Prof. Leandert. So it is indeed a reason for celebration, but it's also an inspiration um, to all of us to, to listen to this. Your, your, the students, I think, um, with your passion, you assist a lot of people officially and unofficially. I know you never say no when someone asks for advice. You are really a guru with the qualitative statistics analysis. And thank you for that um, contribution. Um, we see a lot of full professors tonight, but um, me being the 
data person. Um, in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, only 17% of the staff has joined the ranks of full professor. So for 84% of the faculty, it's still an, an aspiration. Um, also, congratulations to your faculty and your son. I think they know what it is to have somebody that do research a lot in the, in the family. So your success is also their success. Um, uh, Immanuel Kant, who's a German philosopher, said that we should always ask ourselves, um, what can I know, what can I do, and what can I hope? And I think you answer that, and you said it so beautifully, I have it open. My quest will be to apply the model, explore the application of this model, and evaluate the various dimensions of this model and its contribution to immersive learning. And we wish you all of the best with that. Verona, I think with being a full professor, it's not just the title, you have other responsibilities as well. Um, you are now a leader in your discipline. And ultimately, the Northwest University depends on our professoriate to determine the vision of the curricula, of the program, of, of the faculty, and ultimately where the university is going. Um, the fact that you're a full professor also means your work is internationally recognized. And that makes you a very important brand ambassador for the Northwest University. So Verona, thank you for choosing the Northwest University as your home to do your research, and we wish you all the best. Congratulations. I think we can now all stand for the singing of the national anthem.